Good day, everybody out there. Time for another fandom in review. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, Fur Affinity. Now, in the previous episode, I talked about its updates and all that stuff. Um, around the same time, um, information started to come out from the website that you know wasn't really wasn't really discussed too much. They like people at Fur Affinity basically really didn't draw attention to it or anything like that. Um, but basically, more information was leaked out um, about you know internal things at Fur Affinity. Um, more information that really wasn't part of supposed to be part of the general public. Hi, Kitty. Me. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Forget it. Uh, she's she's a pain sometimes. So, anyways, um, that's what we were talking about the leaks here. So the the information now the good news is the good quote unquote good news is that this information that came out recently that was leaked out recently. Is still part of the fallout from the biggest little fur con um, leak, which you can read a little more of that in my previous video, where I kind of discuss it a little bit. Um, I'll put a link up here, and I'll go to the part where it talks about it. But basically, um, the gist of it is like Fur Affinity's site code was, you know, was obtained through an imager exploit in early May of this year. And somebody took the information that they got from that exploit, put them on USB drives, and put them out to the, like basically they put them on a bunch of USB drives and just like spread it out all over Biggest Little Furcon's convention. And basically it made major, major, it made even, it made even outside fandom news headlines because of the problems that it arose from it like people's information, user information, people started to, and, you know, Fur Affinity didn't take the site down, but then people's images started to go missing. People found that sometimes some people were being, you know, that somebody was logging on as them and deleting stuff, and then basically got to the point where not only did they have to take the site down, they had to revert it to a point in earlier in time. This information is also leaked from that same particular area. And this was based upon people's observations that the trouble tickets and the information in it only went up to about May the 4th. Um, so, that being said, the new information is basically CSVs of uh, trouble tickets, um, suspension notifications, and trouble ticket comments. So, basically, it's just information that is. That being said, the information in it is somewhat semi-public facing basically it's somebody talking to somebody it's somebody talking to a user like it's somebody at fur affinity talking to a user so there isn't going to be anything really dirty in this too bad but there's still that issue of if you've given personal information if you have given personal information on fur affinity either through the trouble ticket system or through the note system or anything like that Know that you need to be careful and know that you need to understand that your information could be at risk. You need to take proper precautions, um, do whatever you need to do, get a life lock, get it like, life in, like identity insurance, something like that. If you have ever given out personal information over um, for affinity, because your information could very well be out there. Um, and that's something also important to understand. And if you're new to the fandom and you see this for a fan thing saying, oh, so cool, and you don't know of any of the history, it has a history of being um, maliciously attacked by hackers, maliciously attacked by, you know, not even attacked, but like, not even hacked into, but more exploited. And, you know, code has gotten out there and, and, and think pics and, and things have gotten leaked in the past several times. It happens about once every few years. So be very cautious about sharing personal information on that website. Um, and, 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 and basically, I guess the, the, the general thing is that you should be careful wherever you do it, you know, because even professional companies such as Sony and stuff like that have been, you know, have been victimized by malicious hacking. Um, there, there's every possibility that any site that you use out there can be hacked at any moment. 
Yahoo just had a recently a huge one where they where they got like all their usernames and stuff like that. Since I I haven't used it in uh, what a decade now, more than a decade, a long time. I haven't used Yahoo in a long time. We back in the back in the furry day when I used to use it for the furry Yahoo groups. Eh, who uses furry Yahoo groups anymore? I'm an old man. But anyway, like so. That's the that's the thing. Like you need to be careful and need to be cautious and take proper precautions when it comes to your information security. Because you can't expect anyone else to do it for you, unfortunately. Everyone should expect that people who have power and have websites should know and should have proper security protocols and understanding how cybersecurity works. Unfortunately, the world doesn't always work that way. People who get into power of information systems don't always have the background necessary in order to understand how to prevent such cyber attacks from happening. I know I don't have an extensive background in cyber protection, but I do know a few basic <laughs> key concepts. Don't use the same password for multiple websites, even though it's very tempting. Don't, you know, don't answer the security questions with actual answers to the security questions. You're, if you, if you, <laughs> if, if, Here's the thing, if you're a child and the security question is what is your mother's maiden name, if your mother wanted to hack into it, she knows her own maiden name. Alright, if you're a young snapper, don't answer what is your mother's maiden name. If your mother wants to hack into your crap, she'll figure out what her own maiden name is. Trust me on that. She knows. She knows. And why the heck do they ask questions like that anyway? That's so freaking stupid. It's like, what, did, what was the high school that you went to? Okay. Everybody who is attend who every like so the like 100 kids who were in my class also know what high school I went to okay so who is this protecting me from like who's not like these are answers that anybody on their Facebook any any prolific person on Facebook like would have posts about it's like oh man I remember when I went to X Y Z high school here. And man, was it a good time, man. I want to go back to those days, man, when I didn't have a care in the world and I went to XYZ school here. <laughs> and it's like, so anyone who's like, okay, well, I know that he asked that as a security question. I'm just going to go back through and look through all of his stuff and see if they have any time that they say XYZ school here and type in XYZ school here. Um, it's like never, ever answers a security question with a security question. Have an algorithm. Have something in your head that goes, okay, here's the question. Translate it to something else. Make a cipher. Make your own personal cipher and just make a, a, a random code that is based upon what the, questions be, the question being asked. And that's how you kind of, you know, work that way. That's just my advice. Um, so, and I can't go too deep into security advice, otherwise I put myself at risk, right? But that, that one, I think, is fair enough, and that one is, is good. Um, but anyways, back to the whole topic at hand. Um, so the information in the leaks, now, if you, as I said, if you have given out personal information, you, you should know who you are if you know that you, in the, in the personal, like, if you've given out things. One of the examples I heard about was individuals who were getting over the age of 18 and wanted to have adult access to the website, um, basically giving a picture um like giving you know showing a picture of them with their identification and stuff like that um must be they were like suspended or like physically blocked by the admins for you know lying about being over 18 and then it got out that they weren't over 18 so in order to prove like because to me it's like why not just let them say they're 18 now like why can't you just switch it like the account to an adult account like without too much interference but if they lied about their age then maybe they would want identification proof why they didn't ask for it off the trouble ticket system knowing their own security issues i have no idea but that was one example that was given um other than that there were like there wasn't really anything too juicy in these things and it, it really shouldn't be because if, if someone was banned and, and if someone was suspended and it was for a reason that was controversial, they usually come out about it right away. They usually go, hey man, I was suspended and this is the reason and, and this is wrong and stuff like that. So, you know, it's not, there's nothing here that's 
new or interesting or really anything, at least from my mind, it's like, a lot of people would, oh, look, they, they show that they ban people who bother people who are in admin positions and, and talk about things like that. It's like, well, duh, they do that. It's called, they, if, you, if you're constantly bothering them, they're going to do that, all right? So that's nothing new either. So basically, don't, don't bother admins constantly about things on their own web pages. I mean, they're trying to live their own lives too. But, you know, so, you know, use, if you, if you see something wrong, talk to them, but don't treat them like, you know, don't don't be bothersome. Don't be you know constantly on top of them. Don't be submitting multiple trouble tickets. Going like create a report button or something like that. I heard that one per one of my sources said that one one there was one person who like spammed him like two hundred and something times with make a report button, make a report button, make a report button, make a report button, and it's like. <laughs> It's like they got suspended. It's like, well, you wonder why. You exploited the trouble ticket system, dude. Um, so anyways, um, one interesting thing, and I think this is, this is the one thing that, you know, you might could get information off of it, and I don't think anyone else has really thought about it. But what my sources say is that about five, like, so the one question is, one major question that was asked by a lot of people, it's like, well, how far along are they with trouble tickets? Because it's like, oh, if, it seems like they take forever to answer these things and so like the, the question that comes to mind is like how how big a hole are these guys in how big of a hole are they in as far as answering and resolving trouble tickets well you can't really answer those questions through the data um, from what I've heard but you can get a general ballpark figure um, and the ballpark figure is about there around four or five percent of the trouble tickets are uncommented so basically they haven't responded to the trouble ticket yet. Of course, not all of them warrant a response. Like if someone's spamming the if someone's spamming the trouble ticket system, you're not going to respond to all that spamming. You know what I mean? So, or if they're saying something that doesn't really warrant a response, if it's not really a problem, then there's no reason to really respond to it. So, but at the same time, there are people who say, well, they close out tickets before they really are resolved in their mind but they will close them out you know just because they're resolved like they're resolved in their mind they, they're trying to resolve it and they're trying to get it off their plate before it's really handled so between those two things it's it's kind of a wash so you can't really judge that but they're at around my sources say they're at about around um, 6,000 or so 6,000 to 7,000 trouble tickets that are left basically uncommented and there's about 130 something thousand that are basically that are in the system so that means that you know that minus that is the number that are counted and the other ones are ones that are uncommented so basically if we if we call uncommented unresolved that's around four to five percent so it's better than a lot of people think it's better than a lot of people He's like, oh, they never answer any trouble tickets, and it's all on a stack and stuff like that. I think that it shows that they have been constantly keeping up with it in some regard, regardless if the all the comments are actual resolutions, and on the on the on the flip side, if all the ones that aren't talked about or like don't have a comment on them are worth resolving. But anyways, um, to conclude, basically, you got to be careful with your information. Don't really, I wouldn't, on any furry website, I really, fur affinity especially because it has a history of being hacked into or exploited and getting that information out there. You really need to be careful about sharing personal information and identifying information on web pages such as those. But in this world that we live in, we really, really have to trust the cybersecurity of the institutions that put trust in trying to put, protect our information. Because even, you know, even a Google or a Yahoo or something like that can very much have people trying to get into their systems all the time. And the bigger the fish, the more often it's going to happen. So Fur Affinity is a pretty big fish in the fandom. It's going to see a lot of exploitation. It's going to see a lot of people trying to get into its systems. So just use a lot of caution. Go to external services that are more secure in order to, sit, in order to share information with other people. Um, but that's all I'm going to say for today. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Um, 
kick the click, kick the comments, kick the subscribes. Um, I'm going to get the hop out of here.